a full house today, girl. We do. <laughs> Hello. <laughs> Welcome, Cynthia Revo. Thank you. First of all, I want to just say you look so gorgeous. Thank you. Thank you Tell very much. Tell me about much. this outfit. Uh, well, this is made by a designer and friend called Baltar back in London. And these are simply, uh, where did I get them from now? Uh, you have a designer here who does shoes that d does really good summer shoes for us. I think it's like a C Stephen, Stephen Madden. That's the one. <laughs> yeah. I'm new here. Well, Bear with me. They're beautiful. Yeah. Uh, you may be new here, but you are an old pro when Thank it you. comes to performing. This is your Broadway debut. Yes, it is. Yeah. yeah. For which you won the Tony Award. Uh. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> And the show, <clears throat> the show started previews in November, yeah. and I feel like you have been the front runner for that Tony Award since your first preview. I basically ignored all of that completely because it just made it easier to do the show. Well, I never <laughs> it would freaked have said me out it. every time I saw it. I was like, oh, okay, good. I, I never would have said it before you actually won the award. Right. But now that you have, we can talk about the fact yeah. that it was a foregone yeah. conclusion. <laughs> I actually saw the show very early in previews, mm -hmm. and I was like. Who is this woman? Um, and the, the world knows your name, and um, I cannot wait to see what you do next. Thank you. But I want to talk about what you're doing now. Right. Yeah. Um, the Color Purple won the Tony Award for Best Revival yes, of it the did. Musical. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. And you are continuing on in this incredibly taxing, yeah. beautiful role. Yeah. Your performance has been called spectacular. It's been called groundbreaking. It's been called uh, life-changing. Um, and what I want to know is how you can put yourself through something that is so gut-wrenching yeah. on such a regular basis and still keep such a cheerful attitude in the rest of your life. Um, I, I always try and take it step by step. If I was to think about the end result, the end goal, I would never get there. I, ha I really have to do it like bit by bit because it really is uh, uh, stages in this show that lead you to the next. Um, that, I guess, is how I am able to do that. And I always think of, of it day by day. I never think of, on a t especially a two-show day, you sort of think, I need to come at it from an angle of just, I'll do show one. That is what I need to do today. And when we finish that, we'll think about the next show. And then within the show, you think, well, I've got to get through this. And the next thing happens. And the next thing happens until you find yourself at the end. Yeah. The emotion that you express throughout the show is so palpable. And I have been lucky enough to come back several times and sit everywhere from way up close to off to the side right. and all the way at the top. And when you uh, feel with your body, yeah. I can tell no matter where in the theater I'm sitting, and the tears that stream down your face. Um, how do you get there? Um, I feel like the words in the, the story and the truth of the story are the only thing you really need to get to that place. I have also an amazing cast of people who are dedicated to telling that truth on stage. So it makes it really easy to look into someone like, someone's eyes and know that they're telling you the truth and what they're going through in, in that moment in time is, is happening to them and you can, I guess you communicate with them in that way. And, and the only way to get to those places is to listen. Um, I never think of my story, I feel like what I'm there to do on stage is to help everybody else who's around me tell their story as well. And in doing that, it aids me to tell the story I need to tell for myself as well. You started with this production back in the UK at yeah. the uh, Many Chocolate Factory. Yeah. How has the production changed from then until now? I feel like the essence of it is still the same. Um, but obviously, w when we did it in London, I don't know if many of you know this, but the, the theater we had was only a 200-seater. So we only had 200 people in the theater, and it was on a thrust stage. So basically, I came out to as far as you right there. And, and I would stand in the front of the stage and, and sing. It was basically as big as this little square here. Um, and so now we're performing in front of 1,100 people, which is way larger uh, in a pros arch, which is right across the stage. Um, so you, 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 you use the stage differently now. And then obviously there's 
different bodies, different people, different energies, which you respond to. And so it changes the way you react to people. Some things are slightly different from before. And John has done a, John the director, has done a wonderful thing of um, making sure that he's tailored this piece to the people he has, as opposed to recreating the exact thing that we had in London. So it is different in that we are different people. We're still telling the same story and the essence is still there, but we're able to do it with our own lifeblood, our own selves. Yeah. Well, the the smallness of the um, the design. Yeah. I, I don't want to say smallness, but this, yeah. the simplicity. Simplicity. Yeah. I think just serves to enhance the story. I think so. The set is basically made up of boards and chairs. Yeah. The pro only props are a few baskets and some pieces of fabric. Yeah. And they serve to represent an entire world. Um, as opposed to the original production of this show, which right. had very detailed uh, yeah. sets and yeah. designs, and it really makes it feel like a brand new musical. Right. Um, and you still keep the intimacy of what I imagine the London production Absolutely. was. Absolutely, yeah. The cast from the very first number actually makes eye contact and, and reaches out and waves at, ca at yeah. people in the audience yeah. um, and people up in the balconies. Yeah. It feels very much like... Um, like, we are all there in that town. And yeah. there's even a moment near the end when you say, look at all of these people. Yeah. Well, th we, we want from the get-go for everyone in the audience to feel like they're a part of it. I, don't, I personally don't want them to sit on the outside and watching what's going on on stage. I want them, and our, the cast wants them, and John wants them to feel like they are a part of this town and they are part of all the goings on, so they see it and feel it and hear it just as much as we see it and feel it and hear it as well. So that, but when we get to the end, it doesn't. No one feels afraid to make noise, to stand up, to shout, to get involved because we've already said it's okay for you to do that. Mm. Yeah. Well, last night's performance, which I was fortunate enough to yeah. attend, was a particularly moving yeah. uh, performance of the show. Um, it was clear that the cast, the audience, and the general vibe in the air mm -hmm. was very conscious of the goings on in the world yeah. some of the tragedy that has yeah. um, descended in such a horrific way yeah. and it was both cathartic and incredibly emotional yeah. to be in that room uh, last night can you talk about being on stage and and reflecting some of that back to the audience previous to getting on stage I had tweeted that um, it had been a really hard day and, and personally as well so I and I had decided that I needed the show as well. Because um, I feel like the show offers a little bit of healing. And so I felt like it was my duty to do that on stage in whatever way I could. And so I felt like the, the show, particularly last night, was dedicated to every single person in that audience who was feeling down, whose heart was heavy, whose mind was full, um, just... I don't know if it was relief or space or just the knowledge that someone else is trying to give you a hand. Uh, and I felt like that was what the show was for last night. And we all, I guess, are going through it together. And I wanted that show to feel like we were all people going through the same thing and trying to figure out what to do next. Yeah. What do we do next? We just love harder. I think we, it really breaks my heart, I'm so sorry. Um, we, I think we all have to just make an effort to be understanding uh, towards one another. Um, I like put a prayer out last night and it was surprising to me that some people would be really annoyed by it and and I just want, you, sometimes you feel helpless and you don't know what else to do. You don't know how to help. And I think when you are in that place, all you can do is laugh just a little bit harder and be a bit more hopeful so that your hope might spread to someone else and your love might spread to someone else and that person will take that and give it to someone else. And eventually, eventually, I believe that's where we'll get to, a place of understanding, peace and love, because that's essentially what most of the majority of this world wants and needs. And I think if we're all aiming for that, we'll get there. Thank you. That was very beautifully said. Your strength, both on stage and off, is undeniable. 
Um, I want to turn to your actual physical strength. Yeah. <laughs> um, I love how you show off those arms I, that I am so jealous of, that I, I covet and I envy. I have been watching your, uh, your workout videos on your Facebook page. Um, uh, the, you are superhuman uh, in what you do. You know, you're doing kettlebell swings and snatches, and you're doing so, this crazy uh, version of burpees where you actually do yeah. pull-ups instead of jump squats. And uh, how often, how many hours a week are you spending actually working out? Because you're also mm -hmm. training for the New York Marathon, right? Yeah, so I, st I, I start probably training uh, next week. Um, so I've been doing bits and pieces uh, this week. Um, I probably spend in the gym or outside working out per week, maybe seven to eight hours a week. Um, and that's not including on stage, because I feel like that's a bit of a workout for me anyway. Uh, yeah. Um, and I, I, so there's being at the gym, and I, I tend to, and now it's summertime, so I can, I have like a little razor scooter, like a push scooter. <laughs> so I use that to get from place to place as well. So I use it as like mini cardio. Um, and I tend to, and so once I start really properly training for the, the marathon, which is what I did for the half marathon, you do a recovery run, a speed run, a technique, and a, a, a long run. My long runs will be from like between eight, nine miles to 20 miles. So, <laughs> and well, the marathon, the full marathon is 26 miles. And whilst I was doing the half marathon, it was between like nine miles and 13, because the the half marathon is 13.1. So you try and get to the place where you're comfortable enough to get to that, that point. Um, and so you have a speed run, which for me is like two to three miles, but at like warp speed, you're trying to get as fast as possible. Mm -hmm. And then you have your recovery run, which for me is six miles. So yeah. yeah. Are you doing this on a treadmill? Or are you outside in I'm the outside. 90 degree I'm outside, heat? yeah, yeah, I'm outside. I hope you're hydrating. Yes. Yes, I promise I am, yeah. Actually, my favorite quote uh, of yours about working out is yeah. that you don't listen to music while you're in the gym or while no. you're running no. in order to better listen to your body. Yeah, I think because what we don't realize is that your body tells you whatever it needs if you're listening hard enough. Um, don't get me wrong, if there are days where I thought I was going to do a long run and my body went, mm, no, you're not, your legs hurt, go home. That's what's going to happen. I'm going to go home because if I push against what my body is telling me to do, I, I, in the end, fail. So I just have to listen harder, and, and I can't concentrate with music. I end up running to the beat, and really I need to run to whatever rhythm is necessary so I can pick up the pace at my own pace or drop the pace or pull back, or, and all of those things, because I feel like running is, um, once you learn to do it properly, it really does take technique to make sure you don't hurt yourself or so you can breathe properly, yeah. How do you tell the difference between when your body's like, I don't want to, and when your body's really telling you to stop? Because if I went out there and listened to my body, I'm pretty sure that I would be like, all right, two blocks, done. <laughs> well, but like, like, say for instance, the, the, the I don't want to part of me starts before I even leave the house. Uh -huh. when, I left, when I've left the house, if at mile one, I'm like, oh, actually, this is fine. I'll probably be fine. If by like mile two, I'm like, no, everything is hurting. My knees don't want to do what they need to do. My feet are hurting. I've probably put the wrong shoes on. Then it's like, keep this short, make it a speed one and get home. Um, as for the gym, that's probably, I, I rarely hear, I don't want, I don't want to do it because it, you get adrenaline and serotonin and all that stuff. So you end up working out probably harder than I should do. My vocal teacher tells me off for it, but never mind. Well, you're clearly doing something right. So <laughs> I say keep doing what you're doing. Thanks. It's clear that discipline is a very a consistent part of your life. Yeah. Um, you started your performance career at the age of five in a nativity play? Yeah, nativity play. Uh, uh, <laughs> I was asked to sing Silent Night. It wasn't really any of the characters. I was a shepherd. Um, and for some reason, they wanted me to sing Silent Night. So they asked this five-year-old girl to stand at the front of the stage and sing Silent Night by herself. I just remember really enjoying how people reacted to it. And I realized that it made people smile. It made people happy. And that made me happy. So I just figured that that was what I would do the rest of my life, just try and pe make people happy and smile, because it made me feel great. Mm -hmm. So the drug was there, that was what I was addicted to, making people happy, which in turn made me feel great, yeah.
And you were able to continue performing throughout your childhood. Did Pretty you play much. Juliet at age 15? I did. Um, so there's a, a program at the Young Vic Theatre, which is in London. And what they do is they take a, a young company of actors and they end up doing a youth production of whatever is in the main house. And that year, when I was 15, they were doing Romeo and Juliet. And I remember it's a production by a Polish circus company. And it was stunning. But... Um, they decided that they would do the youth version of Romeo and Juliet, and I ended up playing Juliet. Yeah. And then you went to university. I went to university. Did you study music psychology? I studied music psychology. What is that? So basically, it's like, it is the, the study of how uh, music affects the mind uh, and the, your social standing and how it affects your mood or your body, if it has any effect. Um, and I believe it does. I think it, it, you you can change one's mind or one's mood simply by playing music. It's the way you sometimes you put babies to sleep, it soothes mm -hmm. or it uh, amps up or you play something to get yourself calmer or to, those things. And so it's just the study of that. Um, it turns out I, I, I enjoyed it, but it wasn't stimulating for me because I didn't really, and this is gonna sound like I'm bragging, I'm not, I promise. Um, it, You've I, earned it, girl. <laughs> go ahead and brag. I, I just, I didn't need to go to the the lectures to write the papers. I was passing without having to be there because I, I was enjoying the books. I could read up on the books and write the papers that way in my house. And I realized that that really shouldn't be the way it is. If you're at university, you should be able to need to learn something by going to the classes. Um, and so when I realized that I, I felt like I was in the wrong place. Um, and I bumped into someone serendipitously uh, at a theater that I was working at. And she was doing a, a young actors company at the Stratford Theatre Royal and had asked me to join in. And she was directing it. This happens to be the same person that directed me when I was 15 in Romeo and Juliet. Oh, wow. Yeah. And she said, are you going to train? I said, train what? What do you mean? She said, train as an actress, I said, no. She said, you should, you should train at the Royal Academy of Dramatic Arts. I said, absolutely not, you drive, you're, that's ridiculous, it's not gonna happen. I'm not gonna do that, because I'm not gonna get in. That's, why, do we, why would we go for that straight away? It's the silly. Um, and she said, you're gonna come up to my office, we're gonna fill in the application forms, and you're going to apply to that school. Uh, I didn't apply to anywhere else, and got into the Royal Academy of Dramatic Arts. Yay! And the rest is history, yeah. I guess. <laughs> And you've done so many incredible projects. Yeah. I, I, as I am want to do, I fell down a total Cynthia Revo YouTube <laughs> hole. I watched clips from everything from a, a musical you did about getting stuck in an elevator yeah. to a musical called Lift. I Can't Sing that was based yeah, on yeah. The, the X Factor yeah. TV show. <laughs> yeah. um, uh, I found videos of you from like 2009 that you uploaded of yourself singing Adele yeah. uh, a cappella. Yeah. And I actually learned that you opened for Fantasia Barino, Barino who yeah. played Celie on Seeley, Broadway yeah. in the original. Um, ha have you been in touch with her about? She came to see the show. Yeah? She came to see the show and she was lovely and she was really, she just was the, the nicest person to speak to. She couldn't believe that I was English. She 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 was super fascinated with my accent, and she well, would. I she asked me a question, and I was answering the question, and as I answered, I realized she wasn't listening to the answer because she was listening to my accent. <laughs> so she just kept asking me to say stuff, and I was like, <laughs> what do I, what do I say? I need to respond to something. What what do you need? Um, but she was lovely, and she loved the show, and she it was just nice to hear from someone who had already played the part. Um, it was it kind of like a little bit of a blessing to have her sort of say, you're amazing and this show is brilliant and I'm really glad I came to see it, yeah. And you spent time with Lashans who originated the yes. role and with she was Goldberg the one that gave me my, um, my Theatre World Awards. Uh, Lashans was there as well. Oh. And then I met Whoopi Goldberg who came to see the show as well. I feel like I had all the Seelys just go, yeah. well done, girl. I feel like you guys really should like cool. all go to lunch together. We should. I think like, that'd be kind of cool. Um, Whoopi was amazing. I went uh, on The View and, and sat and talked with her, and she's just been super supportive and sent little trinkets and flowers and chocolates and all of those things and just notes of, of encouragement, and it's been really wonderful to have her do that. It's great. It feels good. And you're also a singer-songwriter. Yes, I am, yeah. You wrote a beautiful song for yes. the soundtrack of a movie. Yes, I did, yeah. Um, Remind I'll teach you to fly before you fall away. Yeah. <laughs> I was hoping, I was hoping I would get you to sing a little bit today. 
<laughs> Are you still writing? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, I, it's something I love doing. It's just another way to tell a story, isn't it? And, and the idea that you can express yourself by writing something on a piece of paper and it can materialize in song is awesome. So those are the kind of things I want to keep doing, writing for movies. I think there's something I might be writing for or singing on soon. You will find out if it happens. Um, but um, uh, but I will keep writing, and it's something I really want to keep doing. Yeah, that's great. Yeah. Well, I'm so thrilled that you're here. Thanks for having uh, me. Obviously, I'm a Color Purple super fan, <laughs> and I am your fan for life. Thanks. I will see whatever you do for the rest of you so yours much. and my existences. Um, it's a it's a real honor to have you here. Thank you. Um, how do you feel about taking a couple questions from the audience? I feel really great about that. Okay, I'm glad because I wasn't actually going to give you a choice. <laughs> it sounded like I was, but who has a question? Hi, Cynthia. Hello. Hi. It's an incredible honor to meet you. Thank you. And congratulations again on your Tony Award. Thank you very much. The feelings and emotions captivated from the audience during your performance really showcase how music is the highest form of artistic expression. Not only do you have a powerhouse cast that you perform with, but Oprah Winfrey executive produced it. Mm. With all of that, how do you balance the three different realities that you may live in and who do you identify with mostly? One being Seeley, mm -hmm. the protagonist in the um, musical. Mm -hmm. Two being Cynthia, the person your mother gave birth to. Mm -hmm. And three being Cynthia Arevo, um, the Tony Award winner that what you're following in Whoopi Goldberg's yeah. footsteps? Um, I think I probably most um, relate to Cynthia, the, the, the girl that was, you, that was born by Edith Arrivo, <laughs> because she's, she's the one that really sort of um, made sure that all of this happened. Um, it's in the nicest possible way, it's her fault. <laughs> uh, it's her fault. She, she it was so wonderful at, um, making sure that I, one, knew to work hard, two, knew it was all right to work hard at the thing you loved the most. And I think that was the most important thing. She never said no when it came to, one day I changed my mind and decided I wanted to be a, a spinal surgeon. And it didn't surprise her. She didn't go, but Cynthia, that's not, oh, fine, okay. She said, she said, okay, if that's what you wanna do, you make sure you work hard. She knew I had the capacity to do it if I wanted to, but it, it took me working hard and, and, and committing to it. Um, and also she's just been super encouraging. And in order to get to the Tony Award winner and to Seeley, I had to fully realize myself, Cynthia, uh, the girl that rides on a, on a razor scooter every single day to get from place to place. Um, and because I'm comfortable in her, I guess it makes it easy to be comfortable in in either Seely or Cynthia Erivo, I guess. Yeah. Like my mother. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. That it reminds me of that moment, the first moment of your Tony acceptance speech when you said, "Look, mommy," <laughs> and I felt yeah. like I was seeing that that yeah. girl. That she had no idea there were cameras on her. So there's a shot of her. And she's just like, "I love you." <laughs> she's crying. She it's no the idea. best moment ever. <laughs> Do we have another question? Hello. Hello. Um, you're incredible. My Thank dream you. for you is that you become a huge pop diva like Celine Dion, Whitney Houston, Mariah Carey. Thank Garrett. you. You're just, I claim your voice. that. I take that. That. Yes. That. that Sending it away. I put it out into the universe, <laughs> Amen. and I will try and manifest it just Amen. for you. All right. Thank you. Um, I'm a singer myself. I'm obsessed with voices, and yours is incredible. Thank when you. did you realize that you could sing the way you do? And when did pe the people around you realize that you could sing the way you do? I mean, the first time I knew that the sound out of my mouth made people happy was when I was five. I didn't know it was good. I just knew it made people smile. But I think it was when I was about 11 or 12 that I knew that I could do something with my voice, that I could hear something on the radio or hear a CD or a song and, and make that same sound. Um, and when I was about 15, I knew I could make it mine, I think. So I think it was about 15, 16 that I learned that that my, what my actual voice was. And from then on, I've just been learning and it's been growing. This year it's grown and changed and every year it will change because I change and I do something different or learn something new that my voice, I didn't know my voice could do. Yeah, I, I think 15, 16 was when I knew what my voice was. I just didn't know what kind of capacity I could do it and use it in yet. Yeah, thank you. Hi. 
Hi, Cynthia. It's Hello. been a pleasure listening to you speak today. Thank you. Um, I didn't know, I saw The Color Purple on Wednesday, the matinee, oh. and I, had, I didn't know what the story was about at all. Yeah. So I was very surprised to uh, find out that much of the story is about Celie discovering her sexuality. Mm -hmm. And what I found extremely fascinating and extremely relevant today is that by the end of the show, not only is she comfortable being who she is, but also finds religion and yeah. finds God. And I yeah. think that those two things don't really go hand in hand mm -hmm. in society today as much as people would like them to. Mm -hmm. So can you just like talk a little bit about that and how powerful that message is? Well, I think, I think there's a, a small warped sense of what it is to have faith. And I think that have, believing in something does not mean that you can't be in love with someone. I don't think that that is the case. And I think for her, she, she needed to feel love from someone and herself. Um, and she found solace and and wonder and amazement in, in God. And I think that it's hard to explain to people that those things can go hand in hand. We just have to be open enough to accept that. Um, and that's often what the issue is, is acceptance and being open to it. Those people, nobody is ever exempt from believing in something that is greater than them that can take care of them. That's essentially what what God is. The thing that looks over you, that oversees the things in your life and makes sure that you're protected and okay. That's what it's supposed to be. Nothing more than that. Nothing to govern over who you love. Who you love is who you love. That's it. Thank you. <laughs> I think we have time for one more. Yeah, sure. Hello. Hi, I Hi. saw you last night, and it was absolutely amazing and thank so you. necessary in that moment. So thank, thank you. you so much for that. Thank you. Um, you've been on our radar for the past, in the U.S., for the past like eight months and have received so much well-deserved praise for your mm -hmm. role as Sealy, um, and yet you've been so gracious and kind and just the same as you've always been from the get-go. Mm -hmm. And I guess my question is, what keeps you grounded and humble, even in the, the span of all the Tony Award seasons and everything like that, and especially because for a lot of people, their anchor point uh, that's present is their family. Right. But for you, your family is overseas, yeah. your boyfriend's overseas, everything like that. Yeah. So what is it that, on a regular day-to-day -day basis, keeps you grounded here? I mean, my, though they're overseas, trust and believe if my mom saw anything of me behaving badly, she would be on that phone so quick. <laughs> You would not believe it. So she's still like the main like touch point for me. She calls me almost every single day anyway. But there's, it, it's also the idea that none, none of this is a given. None of this is, is just for free. It didn't just fall in my lap and it's all been worked for. And also other people are working for the same thing. I just happen to be lucky enough to have received all of these things. And I'm super thankful and grateful that that has happened because it wasn't a guarantee. It, it's happened, but it didn't have to. No one has had to say the things they've said, so I don't take that for granted at all. Um, and also, I, I feel like people in this position should lead by example, like, just be good people. It's, it takes nothing to be a good person. It takes nothing to be grateful for the good things you receive, because I think in that, you're opening yourself up to receiving more good things, because I feel like when you demonstrate that you can handle the good things in in a graceful way, it means you you open yourself up to be ready for more because you can handle what you've already been given. Yeah. You are full of these quotes that I want to just print on T-shirts. <laughs> can we just start a new line? You know all the fashion designers. <laughs> so, you're, oh, I love your heart Thank as much you. as I love your talent. <laughs> Um, and speaking of talent, I'm totally going to put you on the spot right now. Oh, Lord. My favorite YouTube video that I found of you yeah. was when someone asked you to spell your name. Oh, my God. And you did it in song. Okay. So just so everyone can find you after this interview, can you sing us your name? All right. Oh, what did I do before? Let's see if I can make something up. Um, C U I N T H I A. Thank you, Cynthia Arrivo. It has been an so honor much. to have you here.